Hey guys, welcome back to Brian's Mysteries and Adventures on Trail, and today we are going to be discussing Crater Lake, various mysteries and things that have happened there. This is part three in a five-part series. The first video I did was on Yosemite, and the second was on Grand Canyon. I still have two other places that I'm going to do. If you guys are interested in those videos, the one I did on Yosemite, or the one that I did on the Grand Canyon, I'll have links in the description. But today's case is going to be about all kinds of various things that have happened at Crater Lake, everything from mysteries to legends to various unsolved disappearances. But before we get into that, I just wanted to let you know that I do, did finish and get the f final proof back for the first piece of merch that I'm going to be doing. And what it is, is it's a 2022 calendar based on Brian's Mysteries and Adventures on Trail. And I designed this calendar myself, everything from picking the pictures to the font to the layout. And it's a wall calendar, so it's got squares big enough where you can write things in. And I just wanted to do something different, you know. So let me know if you guys would be interested in getting one. Uh, I did get a pretty good deal, and I'm just trying to figure out how much, uh, you know, because I've got to get envelopes to ship them out in, and then how much the shipping would be. But... It should be pretty decent and I just need to know if you guys would be interested in them so I can get them made up and hopefully you guys would. I'm going to show a picture here of just the front cover of it. Without further ado, let's get into today's case and covering Crater Lake National Park. Crater Lake National Park is located in Oregon and is actually the only national park that is in the state of Oregon. It was established on May 22nd of 1902. There was some history behind it with the Klamath Indians who were living in and around that area for thousands of years. And they actually were witnessed Mount Mazama erupting and exploding, which I, couldn't, I can't imagine what a sight that must have been. The Klamath Indians have inhabited the region as far back as 10,000 years, and we know this because we found various artifacts like obsidian tools, spears, legend of Mazama, uh, which it was the name of the volcano before it um, erupted and went dead, and that's what obviously led to the crater of Crater Lake, and we're going to talk more about that. But according to the Klamath Indian legend, there was a raging war between two great volcanoes, Mount Mazama and the Mount Shasta. As the legend goes, right before the eruption, spirits of earth and sky came and talked with the people. Lao was the spirit of the below world who lived beneath Le Yanao, today known as Mount Mazama. Skell was the spirit of the above world. And one day, Lao saw Lola, the daughter of the Klamath Indian chief, and fell in love with her beauty. But she, unfortunately, she rejected him because he was ugly and he was from the below world. Well, he got angry and swore that he got would get revenge. And according to legend, this is what sparked this huge battle and eventually why the volcano erupted. And I know that I'm skipping around because I could do a whole video just on that story. But basically the legend was that these two sides were in this great battle and it caused the volcano to erupt. The first white men to see Crater Lake were John Wesley Hillman, Henry Kippel, and Isaac Skeeters. They were searching for a, a lost cabin gold mine when they f found the lake by accident on June 12, 1853. Of course, these men were very taken by its color, its sheer beauty, and they, na they named it Blue Lake. However, they were more obsessed with uh, mining for gold, so they left it and really didn't, it really didn't get this rediscovered again until August 1865 by two hunters that were working with local road crews from Fort Klamath. Klamath, excuse me. But really, it was this man here, William Gladstone Steele, who was credited for the founding of Crater Lake. He basically saw it when he was a small boy in a newspaper article that was actually wrapped around his school, his lunch, and he just became fascinated with it. And he spent 17 years of his life dedicating work, get this dedicated as a national park. And after all those years, it finally came true when President Theodore Roosevelt signed the bill on May 22nd, 1902 to establish Crater Lake as the nation's sixth national park. And just to be clear, he's credited with getting it established as a national park. Obviously, the Native Americans were the first to inhabit it and find it and live there. So I just wanted to make sure that that was clear that William was just the one who got a push to become a national park and get it preserved. Crater Lake is absolutely magnificent. 1,943 feet deep, it is the deepest lake in America. It gets an average of 43 feet of snow a year, making it one of the snowiest places in America. 
One of the biggest mysteries about Crater Lake is where does the water go? Because Crater Lake has no outlets leading to other water sources, the changing water level of the lake presents a very interesting question and concept. Precipitation rates are more than twice that of the evaporation rates, so scientists don't know where the water goes. They, they have discovered that the steady seepage is what maintains the water balance. Water seeps out of the caldera's walls at a rate of about 2 million gallons of water an hour. But the mystery is still, where does all that water go? There's no path, springs, or other water sources that have been found to carry the same water as the lake. So with complex dynamics, Crater Lake water level will remain a subject of wonder for many years, which I thought was interesting. One more little thing, the Mazama Newt is only found in Crater Lake. It is only found around certain spots of the lake, but unfortunately it's currently being threatened by some kind of crayfish or whatnot. But yeah, this is the only place in the world where you can find this newt. All right, guys, so let's get into some of the various disappearances and other mysterious things that have happened at Crater Lake. Wizard Island has developed much lore over the years because many different rangers have claimed repeatedly of to have seen human looking figures and fire burning on the island at night when the park is utterly desolate and deserted. The stories are all still consistent and when rangers swiftly motored out to the island to investigate they found nobody present and no fire at all. So could this be like an elaborate prank or could it be something? I mean I think this would be kind of an easier type prank to pull off but who knows. On July 4th, 1947, there was one of the most bizarre incidences that happened near Crater Lake. So according to the Crater Lake Foundation, a Mr. Cornelius and his wife were vacationing at Crater Lake when Mr. Cornelius just stood up, handed his wife his wallet and watch, spontaneously then slid down a rock chute, endured a horrific fall, injuring himself really badly. Then he got up, went into the lake and just plopped down into the lake and drowned. And that was it. I mean, everybody was either thinking that it was just a psychological break from reality, but everyone said that prior to that, he was a fine man. He, there was no issues or anything. And what a terrible way to end up killing yourself. So that was just extremely, extremely bizarre. This next case, I'm sure some of you are familiar with, but I have some new thoughts and theories on it. So we're going to be talking about the 1975 case of Charles McClure. He set up out on this awesome road trip journey across America. He was from Virginia and he wanted to photograph, you know, all the beautiful national parks. He traveled in his Volkswagen bug from Virginia all the way to Oregon on a carefully very planned route with a very planned itinerary, keeping a close contact with his personal friends, his parents. And he was very systematic with his phone calls. He eventually made it to Eugene, Oregon, where he hung out with some friends and he told them that he was going to Crater Lake to get some photographs of the beautiful winter and said that he would probably be back within a day or two. Charles, who went by Chuck, was only 19 years old at the time. So on January 8th of 1975, he set out for the park and he told his friends that he, if he wasn't back by February 1st, they should contact authorities. However, he was due back. He was supposed to be back on January 10th. So I'm not sure why he gave such a, a long time to you know report him missing, but that's actually what ended up happening. At first, after Charles didn't come home by the January 10th, his friends just assumed that he had decided to stay out and camp more, take more pictures. But after another week went by, that's when they figured something was wrong and that's when they notified the authorities. The authorities quickly found several witnesses that reported seeing Chuck at the Diamond Lake area, which is about 45 minutes from Crater Lake, and they just assumed that he had gotten to the lake safely. Another witness claimed that Charles had headed out hiking along the North Road, which they thought was odd since that he had been about five feet of new snow. A large search was launched of the wilderness area where he was thought to have been, which grew to involve the FBI, but Unfortunately, the efforts were hampered by you know, huge amounts of snow that had fallen, which got to over about 12 feet. Then on January 30th, a logger said that he had given Charles a ride back out to the entrance due to Charles's Volkswagen van not being able to get through the heavy snow. Some people have speculated why the FBI got involved because they don't typically get involved in missing persons cases unless there's foul play. But, you know, this is a national park, so that's federal land and that technically they can get involved and uh, you know there's just been a lot of conspiracies and rumors over the years of but the authorities did 
shy away from the foul play idea simply because there was no evidence. Their main theories were that they, he had run off or some, or some sort of misadventure and gotten lost, something like that. It was until October of 1976 when a pair of PCT hikers accidentally got a little wandered off the right path and they found a battered up, torn up backpack down in a remote canyon located over 12 miles from where Charles had been supposedly camped out. So they brought it to the ranger's office. In the side pocket of that backpack was a set of keys belonging to a Volkswagen, which was what Charles owned. So the rangers, sensing this might be a break in the case, they went out and they got a photocopy of Charles's key and it was a perfect match. The patrol was immediately sent out on horseback and the area near where the backpack was found called Bybee Creek. And it was not long before the human remains were found right near that creek. And this is where the crazy mystery really begins because they found a pair of jeans that supposedly were in very good condition for how long they had been out there. There were socks poking out from the jeans, which the je had just some broken toes in them, and the jeans themselves only contained little pieces of snapped off shin bones. Furthermore, the belt on the jeans had been undone and the buttons were opened, so that's just very bizarre. Besides the toe and shin bones, the rest of the body was just completely unaccounted for. It was just gone, not there at all. The rangers described it as if this guy had just simply melted away. Now, about 12 feet away from the from his body, the crown of his skull was found and some tiny fragments of other bone. But after a meticulous thorough search of the surrounding turned up no further trace of Charles' remains. The superintendent of the park at the time, Ernest Borgman, said that Charles did not sign any of the park's registries, which is not that uncommon, but just curious. Uh, none of his Bank of America traveler's checks that he had with him had been used. And he was thought to have been seen near this store, the Dry Creek store, around the beginning of February of 1975. It's unconfirmed, but that's a sighting that is often gone unreported in some of the investigations of this case. Now, what do I think happened? Well, after I researched this case and delved really into some of the news archives, a lot of it kind of came a little bit clearer. I think that Charles did go to the park that day, and I think that he went in, and then once he got into the snow, snowy areas, he did meet up possibly with that logger who may have given him a ride out. Maybe he met with foul play. Maybe he tried to rob him, stole his camera. Maybe he ended up killing him and then took him out to a desolate area where this logger would have been familiar with, probably much more familiar with the park, maybe left his body there. Now, I talked to a couple doctors, and something that I found interesting was that when a body freezes and obviously if he had died in the winter that year he would have frozen in all the ice and snow but according to what this doctor told me that when a body freezes like that and then thaws like a year later the decomposition process catches up like really really fast it's not like how a normal body would decompose so it happens really really quickly it's like nature catching up with itself so it often does look apparently like a body would just melt and I'm guessing that if he had met with foul play and you know his body was just thrown there that could account for why it was discovered in such a way personally I do believe that Charles uh, met with foul play I think that possibly you know he was robbed and killed and then you know someone that knew the area just dragged him out there possibly the reason his pants were undone and the person was robbing him maybe tried to take his pants off to try and obscure you know, who he was or identity. And then maybe when he was trying to get them off, he couldn't and just fled the area. I mean, who knows? But I do believe that this was a case of foul play. I don't know exactly how it happened, but that's just my theory. I think it's very plausible that that logger could have possibly killed him. And that's why he was found in such a way. Maybe the logger, you know, cut him up or whatever. I, I don't know. It just, I just think that this was a case of very tragic foul play. However, despite all the oddness that surrounded this case, the authorities ultimately deemed it a case of natural death, and they said the body was probably ravaged by wildlife, which probably did happen after, you know, it thawed and it was springtime came, and... But who knows? I mean, hopefully, I think the only way that this case could really be solved is if someone comes forward, but who knows? Just hopefully one day Charles will get... His family will get the answers they deserve and the justice they deserve if that is in fact the case.
This next incident happened in 1970 when a nam man named David Painbaker, he got a job as a seasonal ranger at Crater Lake during the summer. And he was just looking through all the different things and he found out about this interesting site that a blue gunman F6F Hellcat fighter that had crashed in the area a couple months after World War II it ended. So apparently the Navy fighter had hit the ground hard and everyone obviously assumed that the pilot had died. One of the machine guns was actually stuck into the rocks on one of the, the cliff faces. He was looking at it and it was a relatively short and doable hike so he thought he'd go out and see it. So unfortunately while he was on his hike he got lost looking for the crash site. But he continued hiking hoping for the best. He eventually sat down to sort of think through like what had happened or where how he would get out and he felt like somebody was watching him and he looked over and he saw a skull underneath uh, a log and he was of course shocked and scared but he went over and investigated it and he picked the skull up and eventually hiked out and found his way back to the ranger station with the skull of course he got in trouble for moving the skull and you know all that but the rangers that met with him brought in Navy officials. The Navy officials were able to identify it using dental records and they identified that it was the 22 year old Ensign Frank Lupo who was a, a part of the Hellcats that were flying over and it was his plane that had crashed. They apparently were struggling a bit with the weather and the cloud ceiling was at about 6,000 feet until they were only about 500 feet above the treetops and there was snow and mist, they were emerged in fog only using instruments and unfortunately Lupo had crashed and how bizarre that this guy had gone out for a hike to see the crash site and ended up finding the actual pilot that had crashed in this plane so many years ago and the pilot was returned to his family and they were able to give him a proper burial. This next story happened on February 26th of 1975 when Jean Nunn got up and drove her husband to the Klamath Falls airport and along with her daughter and grandchild, Dave, her husband, was flying back home to Salem in his blue Cessna 182. He had also picked up two 17-year-old student pilots, Jim Pryor and Matt Perkins, who were coming along just to get some flight time. So the plane took off and landed at, in Salem as planned. Dave, Jim, and Matt then strapped, they got back into their Cessna and were heading home to Klamath Falls. Well, that night, Jean apparently got a very cold feeling right after she went to bed. She woke up around 9.30 p.m. and she had this sensation of a hand on le her leg. As she recounted in a 2000 interview with the Klamath Falls Herald and News, she said she looked at the clock and she just knew. She called the airport and told them that the plane had gone down at 9.20 and that they had died at 9.30. Shocked, they confirmed that they had lost the plane off radar at around 9.20 at around 11,000 feet. Jean knew, but apparently nobody else did. Search parties went out and hunted, went down looking for the wreckage, but they found nothing. People speculated that it might have gone down in actually Crater Lake. And it wasn't until seven years later on July 5th, 1982, that a hiker just outside of the park boundary near Huckleberry Campground spotted what looked like the wreckage of an airplane. So he went over and unfortunately he found the three bodies inside the cabin of the plane. And later investigators came out and after looking through the wallets of the people in the plane, they confirmed that it was the three dead men that had left Salem that day. Eerily inside Dave's pocket they found a piece of paper that said lose not thine airspeed lest the ground rise up and smite thee so who knows how jane jean knew this and how she was right she loader she later wrote a book called we fly away to help her deal with the trauma of losing her husband and really just an, an amazing story that she felt that premonition or who knows what it was but i don't know just another amazing eerie story that took place around Crater Lake. One thing that makes Crater Lake so unique is the tree life that what gives it such beautiful color in contrast to the green, the blue lake because Crater Lake National Park is home to four different forest ecosystems. The park has a ponderosa pine forest, a lodgepole pine forest, mountain hemlock zone, and the white bark pine zone. Each one of those are named for the specific dominant tree species, but it really just makes for such a beautiful park. And 
you know, whether you're there in the summer or decide to snowshoe through in the winter, it's definitely a place to, to check out and see. I mean, there are definitely tons of disappearances and things that have happened there, but it doesn't mean that it's also not a beautiful place to explore and adventure in. All right, guys, well, this video is getting kind of long, so I think what I'm going to do is make a part two to some of these series videos with, you know, additional disappearances and events that have occurred in these parks. My thoughts and prayers that go out to anyone who's lost somebody in this park and wishing everybody who plans on hiking this park having a safe and happy journey. I want to thank everybody for watching, as always, and please keep the comments respectful if you choose to leave them. If you have any suggestions for follow-up videos on these parks, please let me know. Thank you to co.ag for providing the background music, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Take care. As always, guys, thanks for sticking with me to the end. I hope you enjoyed this video. Like I said in the beginning, if you're interested in the calendar, please let me know so I can get an idea of how many to pre-order. I'm still trying to figure out what the pricing is going to be like, but with shipping included, it's going to be around like $13 and $14 each. That's with shipping included and the packaging and all that. So definitely reach out to me in the comments. Just let me know yay or nay or send me an email if you have any other ideas. And I'll get those uh, made up right away. All right, guys. See you in the next one.